Hello, hello, and welcome to Gut Feelings, your go-to podcast for advice on matters of the head, heart, and health. I am your host, Lo Bosworth, the founder of women's wellness brand, Love Wellness. You can find us at Walmart in Digestive Health, Target in Natural Beauty, and Women's OTC, Ulta in Bath on Amazon, and of course, at lovewellness.com. On this show, we answer your head, heart, and health advice questions like your best friend would. We're all about building an open community here. So if you have a particularly tough or awkward question for us, that's okay. Ask away. As you may know, tough and awkward is what we do best here at Love Wellness. So with that, let's dive into your questions and today's guest. Today on the show, I am so excited for this guest on Gut Feelings today is psychiatrist, content creator, entrepreneur, and author, Dr. Sasha Hamdani. I'm sure you know her from social media. I'm sure you have learned about ADHD from her because she is a board certified psychiatrist and an ADHD clinical specialist. She has a special interest in all facets of women's mental health and self care. She also has had her work recognized by the White House and Harvard. And if that was not enough, she wrote a book titled Self-Care for People with ADHD. She also has an ADHD management app called Focus Genie. And she is here today to help to answer your questions and give us some tips and tricks for our mental health toolbox. So everyone, join me in welcoming Dr. Hamdani to Gut Feelings. Okay, we have a very special guest on the show today, Dr. Hamdani. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Yes. I feel like you're everybody's psychiatrist on the internet. <laughs> oh my God, I love that. I'll happily take that. It's amazing. Um, I think you shared just such a brilliant perspective on mental health and wellness, and your videos are incredible. You're always giving so much great information. So I'm just Thank so excited you. to have you. <laughs> Yay, I'm so excited to be here. So so I'm so excited to have you on the show. For people who do not follow you online, I would love it if you could kind of bring us up to speed on your history, your expertise, and then we can jump into the questions today because I just love having a medical expert on the show. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I am a board certified psychiatrist and I'm an ADHD clinical specialist. I um, was born in California and I was actually diagnosed with ADHD in fourth grade, but Whoa. <laughs> was unaware. <laughs> I, I, it was brought to my uh, parents' attention um, because I was being really disruptive and I actually like staged a riot in my classroom <laughs> in fourth grade. In, in the fourth like, grade? Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Like God, it was low. It's embarrassing. Like <laughs> it was just like, I got all the kids stand up on their desks, but anyway, like very disruptive, um, got diagnosed, um, and was uh, treated, but I didn't truly know about ADHD, but I, like, I didn't know about it. So I was started on medication. My parents were like, here's something that's going to help you focus. But I didn't, I wasn't like sat down and been like, this was ADHD did pretty well. Um, finished high school, did well enough that I got into medical school right out of high school. So I like jumped in at that point. Um, it was the first time I was away from home and like the wheels came off, had a really hard time. Um, almost like it, in that first year, it was just a mess. And it, I like, I was having such a hard time that I was like, I don't know if I could do this. Went home, realized I had ADHD, started to deep dive into ADHD, started understanding my brain better, started employing new techniques. And then that got me through medical school and got me interested in psychiatry, which mm. is where I did my residency in psychiatry and started to actually like niche down on ADHD. Yeah. And now I get to spend my days talking about ADHD and talking to other people about how to improve their brain. And it is the most fun job in the world. I love that. You know, I have to say, I think a lot of people have ADHD, think they have ADHD now because of social media. Does totally. that make sense? There's all these videos that are not created by experts, by the way, that are just right. created by people that are like, you. if you do this, you have ADHD. If you do this, oh, yeah. you have ADHD. It's like if you were in gifted and talented, you had ADHD. If you leave your cabinet <laughs> yeah. open, you have ADHD. And so in the past year, I'm like, I have ADHD. But like, <laughs> yeah. is it because I like when I walk through my house, I leave a tornado behind me and I don't even realize until yeah. I look and I'm like, oh my God gosh, 
every cabinet and every drawer is open and I go from task to task. Do I have ADHD? Are you trying to ask me to diagnose you <laughs> yeah, on this I'm podcast? On though? the podcast, yeah. <laughs> it's weird though. It's like I can hyper-focus on things. I built love wellness, like, right? But like there's moments where I'm just like, ping, 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 ping. But it was wrong. We can talk on the side. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a deal. That's, but the thing that's interesting about social media and ADHD is I think that, that there was – like that's legitimate. There, there's this huge explosion that happened. Like I think during COVID, when everybody was like in their phones and isolated, we actually had to look at our behaviors and be like, "Is this normal?" And people were talking about ADHD a lot, and so people were starting to look at stuff that they've done their whole lives in this new context of like, "Wait, could this be pathological? Could this be a problem?" Um, so leaving a tornado behind you. I mean, maybe. <laughs> it could be. Oh, it my could gosh. be. <laughs> I think I just need some like practical advice. Anyway, um, well, that's 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 helpful. So we should maybe be paying attention to some of the information on the internet, but maybe not all. There's, I mean, there's a lot of garbage, and that's there's what a I mean. lot of it, good like, stuff. The average person doesn't know. I don't know how to discern between like what's good and what's bad necessarily when it comes to mental health, ADHD, these types of things. I mean, but that's not really like the viewer's fault, right? I think of course that not, with, no. with social media, it's so hard to distinguish between good information and bad information. Yeah. And so a lot of times it's like when I'm, I'm telling, because I think that there's a lot of value in, mm -hmm. in, in getting information online because it's accessible. Like a lot of people, they don't have access to healthcare and they don't have access to learn about good, appropriate evidence-backed information. Right. So there's a lot of good stuff, but I wish there was a better metric for like, this is someone you can trust. And this right. is, you know, even like <laughs> verification, that doesn't really mean anything anymore. Anyway. Yeah, so. I know what you mean. All right. Let's jump into our first question because we have some yeah. really good questions today. So the t first question is a health question and okay. it comes from a listener named Caitlin. She says that your book, Self Care for People with ADHD, was a game changer for her and she loves your app, Focus Genie, which she adds has also been a huge help to her. God, maybe I need Focus Genie. She goes <laughs> on to say that while she's had lots of success on her journey so far, she's learning more and more about the impact that diet and nutrition can have on her condition. So she's wondering if you can share with her some of the foods and her vitamins that can help her with her ADHD symptoms and also maybe some things that don't help. Sure. That's first of all, <laughs> Caitlin, I love that. You're going to make me like actively weep on camera. Isn't um, that nice? No, so nice. So nice. Because like once you put stuff out there, you never really like I've been. You never know. To, you never know. And also I'm like a little bit anxious. And so I just don't check stuff. Like I don't check reviews. I don't check. So I don't know what people say about things like that because I'm not, I'm not I get a place it. mentally. I, can no, do that. I, I get it a hundred percent. Um, but what a great question. Let's talk about things that help first and then things that hurt. So things that help number one, it's not even so much as what you're putting in your body, although that is really important but it's how often you're doing it oh. because with, with ADHD, just like you were talking about with this hyper-focus, you can get into spots where you're like artistically or creatively compelled and something is really grabbing your interest and you get stuck in this void where you lose time. And all of a sudden it's like 12 hours down the road and you're like, yeah, why well, haven't eaten? Um, and so it's a lot of times you, you get into a situation where you're not feeling those kind of normal hunger cues. And so it's about, learning like, okay, even if I'm not really hungry, I need to eat at this point, or I need to segment my day and make sure I'm getting this constant nutrition coming in to level me out. Because when people fall into those holes, those hypoglycemic holes where they're not eating enough, like, obviously you feel like garbage because you don't have enough food in your system, but there are literally not enough nutrients and oxygen fueling your brain. Mm. And so then you're even more in a deficit. So that's, that's a great tip. And so what I tell people is every three hours. Like you should be set, putting something in your body every three hours. Do you need to um, set an alarm to do that if you're, if you are forgetful, girl, <laughs> if you're I in do. the void? <laughs> I do. I mean, I need, so that's like one of the things that when I was creating Focus Genie, I had to, like, I, I, it took like 
two years to develop because yeah. I kept being like, what do I need more? What do I need? And I kept tweaking. One of the things is, yeah, I legitimately forget to eat. And there's a timer mm-hmm. there that I like break down. Okay, I'm going to work for this amount of time. And then it's going to take a break. And during that break, I'm like, okay, this is where I'm going to have my snacks. This is where mm-hmm. I'm going to drink my water. And so it, yeah, I mean, I do. I do set alarms. No, that's really, <laughs> that's really smart. I mean, that's something that I like could think about doing because I don't know when you talk about like going into like one of those, like, I don't know, like the vortex of work, mm-hmm. you know, and all of a sudden eight hours have gone by. I'm very familiar with that yeah. experience, especially when it comes to innovation for the business. You know, mm-hmm. I can go into these like innovation holes where I'm so like laser focused on something for so long. And all of a sudden it's 2 a.m. And I'm like, yes. how did I get here? I know. <gasps> I know. And it's, you know, the thing that's wonderful, not like, I don't want to, I still want to answer that question, but like when you're in those hyper focus tangents, you're able to get done a Herculean amount of stuff in a oh, small it's amount crazy. of time, which is insane because like if you were in a spot where maybe you're not as com- like, pushed naturally by your own interest level it may take you three weeks to do that amount of work but then you're just like in this mode and it's so it's incredible it's just a matter of like being knowledgeable about what those moments entail and then being able to fuel your body accordingly yeah okay Um, so i like the idea of eating on a schedule and making sure that like it's every three hours just so that you're fueling your body and your brain and then you know, and I should be more picky about this. And like uh, in the past, I've, you know, through my medical training, I've worked with dietitians, I've worked with nutritionists and, you know, yes, there are, there are things that you definitely should prioritize. Like you should be eating things with a good balance of carbohydrates and proteins and fats, good, healthy fats, great for the brain, avocados, Mm -hmm. nuts, things like that. But honestly, I, I, like, I don't have a super restrictive diet. It's about finding what works for you. Yeah. And finding, like, listening to your body. And so I think more importantly is rather than being, like, super restricted about exactly the proportions you take and exactly, like, w- eat frequently, eat what you feel like is good for your body, and then mm-hmm. avoid things that are bad. Because I think if you if you, like, put stuff into, like, this category where you're trying to, like, I, I need exactly this proportion or I need uh, this, this has slightly more protein than this other thing. I, I like, it gets complicated and then you lose momentum. It's like hard enough to maintain in and of itself. Right. So, so I think, just eat some food, <laughs> eat some food, man, eat some food that you feel is good for you. That makes you feel good. And you know, you know, in your body, your body will tell you what you like and you don't like. So it took me a long time and I don't think this is right for everybody, but it took me a long time to figure out that my body just hated gluten like it hates it and like for a while I was like okay like my I I am like so bloated but I was like whatever (laughs) like that doesn't matter to me but then once I tied it with brain fog like no it's not it's not really the bloating that's a problem to me it's that my response time is so delayed and that it takes me so long to like finish the work that I'm supposed to do that's the thing that actually like I was like, okay, now it's worth it to me to actually start cutting it out. Yeah. So figure out what your body likes. Yeah. Body likes, doesn't like things that are typically on the list that maybe you should look at to see if you want to avoid are super refined sugars. I mean, those, they like shoot up your blood sugar and then crash it back down. And with an ADHD brain, with any brain actually, but with an ADHD brain in particular, you really like that kind of rapid high because there's Mm. a lot of dopamine and stimulation. Mm -hmm. And so you can get into these cycles where as soon as you're up here, that's all you want. And it's not necessarily great for your body. Mm -hmm. Um, Other things are, you know, besides the refined sugars, things that are like too heavy for you. So like in certain times of the day, I know that like for lunch, I'm not going to eat a huge creamy pasta like that. I will go to sleep like things like that know what's good for you and then eat what your body likes. Yeah. Do you think that the, um, advice when it comes to this stuff changes depending for like a, within a a women's cycle, right? Cause like when I, like I got my period today and I've been PMSing for the last few days and it's been a lot harder for me to like concentrate. Right. And just like, 
I'm like looking at my apartment and my life lately being like, oh my gosh, I need to like completely reorganize everything and all this stuff because it, like, it's just wild. Right. And, but I don't always feel this way and I can always tie it to like some hormonal moment or some hormonal shift is like, there's something that I think is there something we should be doing differently from like a food perspective to support focus during, let's say like one of these big, like hormonal drops or shifts in the month? Yeah. So can I blow your mind with some medical knowledge? Please do. <laughs> Cause I didn't know this until like the tail end of medical school. And I was like, why they should be screaming about this. So what happens during your um, menstrual cycle is that, and like, by the way, this is like, like base level knowledge, because this also applies for perimenopause and other, other periods in your life. But when your estrogen kind of drops, so like that premenstrual period, so right before your period, your estrogen is dropping. The problem is estrogen and dopamine kind of go hand in hand. So when that drops, your dopamine drops. And when dopamine drops, ADHD symptoms are worse. So it's harder to stay organized. It's like, no, <laughs> joys <laughs> of having a uterus. <laughs> They're just like, it, so it, things get intrinsically kind of harder. Brain fog might be worse. It might be harder to do executive function, which is planning. Mm -hmm. The thing that's also horrific which I feel like they should talk about more is that, you know, when people are talking about like the emotional side of PMS, right. It, where I am, I'm crying more or I'm more irrational, or I feel just like very hormonally driven at this point with ADHD that's compounded because mm. those, uh, that dopamine is low. So if you were having PMS anyway, now with ADHD symptoms, that gets worse. So it's, it's, it's Great. a thing. <laughs> yeah. I've been thinking about my, my, the last few days and I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay. Well, that's good to know. It's just the know that you more, the more you know about your body, I think the more that you can make peace with these sort of moments that are challenging and understand, okay, this is going to come to an end at some point. I'm going to turn the corner and totally. it will be okay. <laughs> and like, um, I feel like during those periods of time, honestly, like I plan my month accordingly. I know mm. that the first week or so of my month, it's just, that's going to be a harder time for me. And yeah. so like, if I have big things or if I can push off things, I try to do my big stuff like kind of later in the month or mid month or things like that. Um, and during those times where I'm just like kind of in it and yeah. having a hard time, I'm just like, I, exactly what you were saying. I know this is going to pass. And so doing low lift kind of things like that's where I'm like nesting or doing like light organization or stuff that isn't requiring too, too much of my brain. Hmm, That's really interesting. Now I'm starting to think like, okay, I need to put set a timer for for meals. Now I need to like look <laughs> at my month and be like, this is the week you should do this. This is the week you should do in advance. Huh, interesting. It's, okay. Yeah. Let's move on to our next question um, because the qu the questions are they're good today. This is a head this is a head question and it comes from Ava. She's 29 years old. She was recently diagnosed with ADHD. She says that the diagnosis has been a revelatory experience for her and she realizes how big of an impact her condition has had on her finances over the past couple of years and her trouble managing money. So she's hoping you can help her out by giving her some tips on how to set up some ground rules for herself so she can better manage her money as she works to manage her ADHD as well. Mm, such Ava, 10 out of 10. Right? So this, I'm like, this is so stuff good. I've never thought about before. <laughs> I know. And, and no one really does until you're like right in the thick of it. And that's, that's one of the reasons uh, that, uh, that I put together Focus genie specifically. Yeah. I know I keep talking about that, but it, like that. No, it I'm has downloading. I'm it. going to download no. <laughs> it right now. <laughs> but Answer it, the question. it has um <laughs> it, you know, it has an entire area dedicated to finance and budgeting and things like that. And I think that one of the things for ADHD people is we develop a very unhealthy relationship with finances. I and I think that part of that is like when you don't have a great control over executive function, you have a hard time budgeting and planning. Mm -hmm. When you have a hard time with impulsivity, you have a hard time maintaining whatever budget you had because right. you're you're spending it before you can actually get a chance to kind of figure out appropriately where it goes. Mm -hmm. You may have issues with like maintaining job consistency and that makes it difficult to plan around. So there are lots of different ways that this can be really 
difficult to manage. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of the things that I have done and that I've suggested for people is number one, educating yourself about money. There's like really good social media um, sites that they can, uh, they do, they, they teach you about money and it's like Mm -hmm. in a non-judgmental way that it's easily digestible. Number two is just, trick your own brain (laughs) so like (laughs) if i know i am like for me it's not so much stuff it's travel like Mm. if i'm uh, traveling anywhere money does not it's not a real thing to me it doesn't exist (laughs) no it's just Ah. like oh i'm traveling i'm on the end like that i mean that's the airport that's the hotel that's it like and then i come back and i'm like I am ruined. <laughs> like, what did I do? Whoops. And so it's right. And it's like every time you'd think I would have learned that. And so I, um, I think part of that is like tricking your system. And so some of that is like, I know if I'm going on trips and things like that, I'm not going to bring a credit card. I will bring a straight up old school debit card or I will bring cash or I will bring, I will bring something where I have a more tangible understanding of like, this is the money in it and I cannot go above this. Right. It will get declined or mm-hmm. I will run out of cash to give you. Yeah. Because then I'm like, I can spend this amount of money to do this adventure. And, and like when I'm doing it, I don't feel like I'm restricting at that time, because I'm like, right. oh, I have what I have. Whereas this is if what I, I don't planned that, for, it's yeah. there. Use it in whatever way you want, but that's it. <laughs> yeah. And so it's just like, is it less fun? Probably. But it's a more responsible way so I can continue doing this. So is this why, because you talked about sort of like that dopamine high, right? And because when you spend or you impulse mm-hmm. buy, or even you're just bored watching TV and shopping on Amazon. Like, yes. are you spending irresponsibly because the ADHD brain like wants that hit? <laughs> yes. And the thing that sucks is that literally sometimes I'm doing that and I'm like, oh yeah, that's great. And then the minute it comes, I'm like, I don't want this anymore. I know. <laughs> I don't want this. I, why did I do this? And now I have to like go through and like mentally be like, okay, now I have to return it. When does that go? When does that window over? So it's, I, it's taken me a long time to kind of figure out like what, like with that impulsive spending, mm-hmm. giving myself a waiting window, because like in the moment it feels very urgent. And especially like I, I am consistently duped by like, Uh, the sale is ending in 40 minutes like i need to so much urgency so i'm like oh okay i gotta get this sweatsuit right now (laughs) otherwise this is my life will not continue yeah but what i've decided to do is like if it's not something that like isn't going to impact me significantly like if it's something that i would consider is a bigger purchase or something that i wouldn't normally do or i'm like hesitating a little bit if i'm hesitating I wait on it for a full 24, 48 hours. And then by that time, if even if it's like not on sale anymore, I've discovered that I want it enough that I'm like, okay, whatever. And either I'll, at that point, I'm like, I do want it. I'll wait till it's on sale again, or I'll buy it in that moment. Mm-hmm. Or more likely, what, and I'm talking like 90% of the time, the next day comes around, I'm like, nope. I, why did I even want that? Or maybe you just forgot about it entirely. <laughs> right and then you and then you know you really didn't want it (laughs) I know and so then it's just like if you if you start setting that rule for yourself you're uh, you'll get into a situation where you're like okay like I feel like I have more agency over my purchases Mm -hmm. and that's a very empowering feeling I think yeah I think that's helpful I mean just having this conversation and being made aware of the connection I think yeah. is really powerful right totally I, I had no idea that you could connect sort of the ADHD brain to trouble saving money financial struggles but of course like that makes sense of course but not a lot of people are having these conversations and so I'm so happy that you are and kind of like bringing it to light and sharing the information it's incredibly helpful um Okay, so we have one more question. It's matters of the heart, 
It comes from Jess. She says that she struggles with extreme sensitivity to criticism or rejection. And she's noticed, obviously, it has an impact on her dating life. Uh, she says that she keeps settling for people who are not right for her just because they don't challenge her in some of those ways that makes her feel uncomfortable. So she's hoping that you might have some ideas for her on how she can start to confront this behavioral pattern and work towards finding a more meaningful relationship in her life. You were so right. These are such good questions. They're, they're <laughs> fire questions good today. Questions. I know. The audience came. They're here. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, this is amazing. Um, so the, what a lot of people don't know, because it's not part of the diagnostic criteria, even though, by the way, that's like a whole separate conversation. It should be. Mm -hmm. um, there is a phenomenon called rejection sensitive dysphoria, which is an extreme emotional, sometimes physical, but emotional sensitivity and pain to perceived or real rejection or criticism. So like, th like think about, by the way, this is present in almost 100% of people with ADHD. So it is super common. It, it's a varying degrees. But think about dating where you're at your most vulnerable. And now you're being, fa you're being put into a position where you are in situations where you're trying to be vulnerable, but the thought of rejection or criticism is so crippling and you have such a physical and visceral reaction to it that that kind of dictates your reaction. So it's not surprising to get into that pattern of, I, I don't want to say dating beneath you, but that's exactly what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like people who don't challenge you and don't yeah, make no, you work I hard and don't understand. make you grow. And I'm saying that, yes, as a psychiatrist, but I'm also saying that as someone who's experienced those patterns. I mean, I have dated people that in my more advanced age, <laughs> I'm like, no, that was a terrible idea. And not that I don't learn from that, but like part of the reason I feel that I went into a relationship or even entertained it because it didn't feel scary because I didn't feel like there was anything to lose or that there was anything, and which isn't fair to the partner either. Right. You're, you're putting uh, you're being in a, in a inauthentic relationship where you, you feel like you deserve better. You, and you probably treat the other person accordingly. Right. And so moving past that pattern, I think number one is understanding that that is a very real phenomenon. Rejection, sensitive dysphoria, RSD is very real. Um, the things you can kind of do to work past it is one, acknowledge it. And so sometimes when you're having this intense feeling of rejection or criticism, and like for me, depending on who is triggering it at that time, like I could feel it in my chest and it feels like a panic attack, or I can feel it in my face. Like if it's like, if it's someone like, I remember in medical school, if it was like an attending or someone who was like, trying to ask me questions on the spot, I, like my whole face, I'm, I'm brown, so you can't tell, but like it was <laughs> like red and it was like difficult for me to like, I felt dizzy, I felt hot. Um, and so um, sometimes if you don't know that that phenomenon exists, you're like, am I having a panic attack? Am I having a stroke? Do I have something neurological going on? Yeah. Um. So that's one thing. Number two is that once you recognize that that is a phenomenon, understanding the triggers. And so sometimes if you're in a relationship, that communication can be the thing triggering you. So if mm. you understand that phenomenon and you feel comfortable and you want this kind of relationship to mature and grow and progress, it's a matter of talking to your partner about like, hey, when you said it like this, that made me feel anxious, scared, rejected. And I know you didn't mean it like that, but but this is how you probably should have said it. And this is what's going to enter my brain so I can respond to it appropriately without freaking out in the moment. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there actually is um, medication that you could take to make this a little bit easier, which is fabulous. Hmm. That's interesting. It's an option. Yeah. I, I think what's interesting about some of this stuff, um, you know, I, I know a couple people who are really sensitive to criticism, rejection, you know, t to the point that it really does affect their dating life. And mm -hmm. I think one of the things about this is when they say like, oh, I'm just sensitive, mm -hmm. people who are not as sensitive have a hard time relating 
And so they're just like, like, come on. You know what I mean? There's, I don't think there's a lot of like empathy happening or like empathy transfer. And I just wonder, you know, if you don't experience this and you kind of like side eye it, like, I don't know, I guess how as a psychiatrist, do you like tackle some of these like invisible um, struggles or challenges that some of your patients have, you know, or like, how do you um, help them to communicate, you know, what they're dealing with effectively to like partners or parents or whatever, right? Because all this stuff is kind of like, I, like, I imagine if I call my mother after this, I'm like, Mom, I have ADHD. She'll just yeah. be like, no, you don't. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I think that a lot of that is developing your own understanding of your brain. Like, once you understand your brain and you understand – because, right, if you're operating on, like, you don't know where, what ADHD is, you don't understand what rejection sensitivity is, then a lot of it is, like – I am too sensitive. I should be, I should be able to tolerate this, but I can't, I don't know what's Mm -hmm. wrong with me. So I think once you understand and you develop a language around it, you can better use that to communicate with partners. And a lot of, a lot of that early dating experience. And I, and I get it like, right. It's about finding that right partner who's willing to do that. But sometimes in that early exploration phase of your diagnosis and, and your um, management, like involving a partner can be really helpful. Like Mm -hmm. I've had patients of mine come in with their uh, boyfriend, with, you know, with their significant other, with parents that they were like, I, I don't have that language to explain what this is. Will you explain it? Mm -hmm. And so I, I, and I love doing stuff like that, being able to talk to families because I feel like ADHD impacts everyone kind of around you and it impacts how the person is relating with their environment. And so I think it's really important to treat it the whole system at a time. Mm, That's really interesting. You know, I always thought that if you have ADHD, like you take this medicine and that's it. And you can focus, 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 and it's not a problem anymore. But after this conversation and and learning more about you and what you do, I think it's really uh, changed my perspective. I've just even learned so much through this conversation that there's so many like behavioral tendencies that um, reflect reflect this and that you can think about it and uh, think about them in an entirely different way. Um, if you have the right tools, right? You need a toolbox, it seems, to to help manage, you know, if you struggle with ADHD. How yeah. uh, what is like the percentage of the population, adults, that have ADHD? So because to question. me, this sounds like every human I know. Oh, <laughs> I know, and I think hey, that's right. I'm like, um, isn't this kind of just the human condition to a certain degree? I think everybody feels like there's a lot of ADHD that is so relatable and they feel like, okay, this, this sound like even the sensitivity stuff, like no human likes rejection. Right. I think what makes ADHD different and distinct as a clinical condition is that it's not, it's not episodic. This isn't like, uh, it's, you have this constantly chronically, this is something you can't really get away from. You don't have periods where you're like, it's completely gone. It's like, oh, there's some days where I can manage it a little better. There's some days where I can't manage it, but it it is their low level. And so it, and I think what is really important about, and people fight me on this all the time, but I stand by it. Um, I think that attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, I think the disorder is the important part because a lot of people are like, you know, ADHD, I, I think I have it but it doesn't impact my life in a tremendous way. Like I, you know, socially functioning, um, academically functioning, financially functioning, like it it doesn't impact me. If it's not causing deficits, it isn't a disorder. Mm, Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't think I have ADHD then. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's some it's an interesting thing. The thing it's causing like, oh, deficits like maybe a few days out of the month. <laughs> but not uh, like yeah, when you really clarify that it is something that you cannot escape, 
it yeah. helps me, I think, see the difference between maybe just the human condition and what somebody who does have ADHD really deals with just on a constant basis. And but by the way, I think that a lot of people who do who do feel like ADHD really resonates with them. I think that the, the behavioral management for ADHD is helpful for anybody. I think uh, like yeah. if you feel like it can optimize your brain, like all of that stuff is just really good for a brain that may be a little bit more on the chaotic side. And so there's stuff that like, I, I never discourage people about learning about ADHD and learning how your brain functions, because even if it doesn't meet that, that very narrow scope, because by the way, we're basing that clinical criteria on like, stuff that was written a million years ago. And I think it definitely needs to be revised. Right. Is there like um, a, a scale or like a spectrum of, you know, within, is there an ADHD, ADHD spectrum of people who like really suffer versus people who maybe have it like a little bit easier, but they have it. Yeah. So, I mean, again, it's not clinically diagnosed is like it's not put into mild moderate severe okay but, but anecdotally <laughs> anecdotally and from like when you look at especially like when you look at like even looking at my patient population you can you can isolate people that fall into distinct categories of like okay this is impacting them maybe in a minor way that it's impacting like maybe one facet of functioning this is only kind of impacting dating and it impacts the other stuff, but they have behavioral skills to manage other stuff. And then there's the other side of things where it's like, this bleeds into every facet of their life and they have such a hard time functioning that they need excessive supports or not even excessive supports, but they need a tremendous amount of support in order to function. And so I think that with, when you look at that scale, it's not like, again, not necessarily a bad, a good thing. It's not, and it's not like even with the mild and the moderate and the severe, I think that also indicates the mild, moderate, severe indicates like how much support someone needs. Because like with adequate support, it doesn't matter if you're mild, it doesn't matter if you're severe, you, you can get kind of through it and do really well. It's just, it's just how much you need in order to function in a neurotypical setting. That's really helpful. So for anybody who's listening, who thinks that maybe they do have ADHD or they know that they have it, um, what are, what's kind of like, I guess, if you suspect that you have ADHD, but you're, you haven't been clinically diagnosed, right? Like what is step one? What do, what do they do? So if they want to get help, right? <laughs> yeah. If they want to get help, I think, no, oh, I think, um, learn about your brain. Number one, I mean, and I would say that even prior to like going down the rabbit hole to finding a provider, because mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of behavioral management you can do on your own. There's right. a lot of like optimizing your own wellness, optimizing your own um, nutrition and diet and exercise and sleep. And all of those things I think are going to benefit you pretty greatly. If you're like, you know what, I think I need medical help in order to kind of do that and guide you through. Um, going and looking at, and this part, it's, it's hard because access to care is such an issue, but like, if you're going through insurance, calling your insurance to see who can do a ADHD diagnosis and whether that's a therapist, whether that's a pediatrician or a primary care doctor or a psychiatrist, if you have your it, like pick, I would pick a psychiatrist just because they're the best trained. Um, you know, when, when we go through our medical training, we've gone through medical school. So we understand like underlying medical conditions. We've gone through psychiatry residency. So we have a really good understanding of like underlying psychological conditions, as well as like a really deep understanding of medications, um, which is like a benefit. And, and there are great providers in any other field, you could find one. But I feel like, I feel like if you have no knowledge at all, a psychiatrist typically are the best equipped to handle ADHD. This has been so helpful. I love this episode. Uh, yeah. You are brilliant, Dr. Hamdani. Where can listeners find you? What yeah. should they look for? They put out into the world. Well, um, you can follow me on socials. I'm on Instagram and TikTok and YouTube as the Psych Doctor MD. Um, my book um is self-care for people with adhd and that's out through simon and schuster and that's available everywhere 
Um, and then Focus Genie, the app is out and live. It just it just got released in September. Um, and it's been it's been great because it talks about it's it's a really wonderful way of like tracking your focus and fidgeting and impulsivity. And so like that's that's truly how I figured out like that premenstrual period was a problem. Oh. <laughs> I was like, oh, interesting. So, I mean, it's, it's a good way of like isolating your patterns, but it also has educational modules that do a lot of teaching as well. And it's self-paced. So it's, it's, it's a fun little program. Awesome. I love it. I downloaded the app, so I'm going to, I'm going to check it out. Um, Well, thank you so much for your time. This was like very, very interesting and eye-opening for me. And I hope you have a great day. Thanks, Dr. Hamdani. Thanks. Everyone who is listening today, please join me on your end of the phone in giving a big thank you to Dr. Sasha Hamdani for coming on the show today. I- I'm just so floored and blown away by what we talked about. I learned so much about ADHD, the subject matter in general. So thank you guys for listening in, for sending us those amazing questions for today's episode. And if you have a head heart health question, please email us at gutfeelings at lovewellness.com. You can DM it to me or Love Wellness, or you can leave your question on our show's social post in the comments. And if you like the show, please hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. I'm Lil Bosworth, and I will see you next time on Got Feelings. Got Feelings.